All right. Happy Thursday, everyone. Thursday, week five. So we have chapter eight, nine, and 10 to go. Chapter eight tonight, we'll do chapter nine next week. I, our classes are going to be getting shorter and shorter because um, we're only doing 9.1 on Tuesday and then 9.2 on Thursday next week. And then see 10.1 doesn't involve any math. So I'm going to do 10.1 and the first half of 10.2 on the Monday week seven. And then um, 10, the rest of 10.2 and 10.3 week eight or the Thursday week seven. So classes are going to be pretty short. It's a good thing considering we're going to be starting at 530 again next week. And then we can talk about if we want to go back to five o'clock or if we like 530 because the classes are going to be short. So I'm perfectly fine either way. We'll talk about it and maybe take a, take a vote and see what everybody wants to do. So today we're going to do sections 8.1 and 8.2. We're going to talk about what sampling distributions are for proportions. We're going to start that, um, or actually we're going to start with sample means. We're going to look at something called sampling distribution with normal population and non-normal population. And then in 8.2, we're going to look at sample proportions and talk about how to calculate those probabilities. So basically, normal CDF is going to be your friend again. And most of you seemed pretty um, good with using normal CDF. So we're just going to be doing a little bit of, um, of tweaking the, the math before we enter it into normal CDF. And it's it really isn't that complicated. Chapter eight is usually one that people are like, yeah, this is pretty good. I can do this. So just letting you know. And th then we're going to look at a, a couple of homework problems. The ones that I get the most emails on, we're going to look at those in my open math. That way, maybe I'll get fewer emails. I don't mind the emails, but I'm sure you would guys would appreciate not having to send that email. So we'll go through that. And that's where we are tonight. Should not be a very long class. It usually goes pretty quickly. Okay. So we're going to talk about a sampling distribution and what that means. So. Um, if I took a sample size from a population, let's say that the population is, let's say our class. So we have 25 students in our class and I'm doing sample sizes of size five. So if I take every single possible sample of size five, that is a sampling distribution. So I take every sample that I can possibly get of size five, that would be a sampling distribution. So if I took the average of every single one of those samples. So I took all of the samples of size five and I took an average of each one of those. And then I had a new data set that's just all of those means. That would be a sampling distribution of sample mean. So as you all know, if I take a bunch of different samples and I find the averages of those samples, they're going to vary quite a bit. They're going to, I mean, if I ended up getting a sample that was like the five lowest, then it's going to be a lot smaller that averages than the sample of the five highest values. So the means vary a lot. We um, deal with the sampling distribution of sample means and we find our, um, we approximate the population mean. We approximate that in order to get a better idea of what the actual mean is. So we only do this if we don't have a full population, we only have a sample. And I'm gonna explain it a little bit better as we go. Oh, and I also forgot we do have, um, uh, no, lab is next week. So next week, Thursday, probably I don't know, probably Thursday next week, we'll do a lab. I'm just letting you know, just so you know what's going on. It's not this week, it's next week. All right, so let's move on. So here's kind of an example, uh Oh, if I can get there. So the government wants to figure out the average of all incomes of the U.S. households. They can't survey every household to find their um, find what that average is. You just can't do it. So what they do is they take one take a survey of about two hundred fifty thousand people randomly selected, and then they find out that the average of those two hundred fifty thousand is this amount right here, seventy two thousand six forty one. Then they take another sample. And the same thing, 250,000, another random sample, they get 71,849. Then they take a third sample and they take they find out that that average is 72,978. 
these get, are vary a lot. But if I took those three samples and I averaged the means of those three samples, I could get a pretty good idea of what the actual average income is in the US, right? And it'd probably be much closer to what the true average is if I averaged all the average. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. So um, you don't have to write down this process. This is just kind of explaining what we do with um, sampling distributions of sample means. So you don't have to write these down. I'm not gonna ask you to reiterate these and give them back to me. So the first thing you do is you take a simple random sample of whatever size. So this little n is your sample size. You calculate the mean of that sample. Then you go back and you take another sample and you do the same thing and you keep doing this. Keep taking all of these samples until you've taken all of them. And you're averaging each and every one of them. So once you've taken a particular sample, you can't take it again. Even if you randomly choose the same sample again, don't use it again. Kind of makes it weighted a little bit more. So you don't need to write this down. This gets a lot less complicated as we go through the math. Don't worry. All right. So the weights of pennies minted after 1982 are approximately normally distributed, which um, normal distribution is good. The mean is 2.46 grams and the standard deviation is 0 0.02 grams. So we're gonna approximate the sampling distribution of sample mean. We're gonna take 200 samples of, of N equals five. So we're gonna take 200 samples of size five. And I'm gonna find the average of every one of these samples. So 200 times I'm gonna grab five pennies and I'm gonna average their weight. And I'm just gonna keep doing that. Don't worry, you don't have to put the data into any kind of um, table or anything. We're, I'm gonna show it to you in a minute. So uh, my first sample looks like this. And then I took the mean and I have 2.479 for that mean. Here's my samples. So each one of these, I took a sample of five pennies and I weighed them and I averaged their weights and then I recorded each of those 200 samples averages. So this is all of them. So I'm gonna graph this in a minute. So the standard deviation of these, so the standard deviation of all of these values is 0 0.0086. And the average, the mean of those 200 sample means is 2.46. Let me give you, show you the histogram. So I took the average of all of those averages. So I averaged the averages and got 2.46. And the standard deviation of those means is 0 .08, 0 0.0086. So this is another really good thing about um, using these sample means. So if I just use the actual penny weights, the standard deviation is probably going to be larger because I'm just taking individual penny weights. But once I average them all and then I compare all the averages to each other, it causes my standard deviation to get smaller. You'll see this in a second. So here's the first histogram. So this was a um, when I used sample size five. So here's what my histogram looks like. Now it's pretty much bell shaped. I mean, it, it kind of has a slightly off center mode. So it's slightly off center there, but it is, I mean, a little bit of a skew, but not really bad. It's pretty much bell shaped, but let's see what happens when I'm gonna change my sample size. So I'm gonna show you what happens. This is what role does the sample size play in standard deviation. So I'm gonna show you a second here. So let's try sample size of 20. Take a look at this histogram. So this now, this right now is my standard deviation. My standard deviation for sample size five was this. So my standard deviation is, is almost half of what it was for um, n equals five. And isn't that bell shape prettier? It looks a lot nicer. That is a lot better bell shape than before. So as the same, I'm gonna go back to the screen. As the sample size increases, the standard deviation decreases. So you might want to write this down. I'll give you a moment or, yeah. I'll give you a moment to write it down. 
We will be coming up on math here pretty soon. As the sample size increases, the standard deviation will decrease. All right, let's go to the next, let's go back where we were. All right, so now is where we're gonna get to the math. So if I have a simple random sample of size N, so whatever that is, um, from a large population with my mean, mu, and standard deviation sigma. So my mean, the mean of my samples, the, so when I take the mean of all the means, we will just say that is our mean. So we are, we are assuming that, that the average of all of those averages equals the population mean. So our sample distribution mean equals our population mean. That's what this means. So this is sample distribution mean equals population mean. With standard deviation, because as you noticed, as our sample size changes, so does the standard deviation. So our sample size, or our standard deviation is dependent on the sample size. Therefore, we have to do a little bit of a calculation, which is this right here, to get a new standard deviation, also called standard error. They mean the same thing, or I'm gonna call it new standard deviation. So if my open math asks you for the standard deviation of your sampling distribution, use this formula. If my open math asks you for standard error, use this formula. So what you do is you take the population standard deviation and you divide it by the square root of your sample size. They'll give you the population standard deviation. You don't have to worry about that. So you take the population standard deviation, divide it by the square root of your sample size, and that'll give you the standard error or your new standard deviation of your sampling distribution. We're gonna, we're gonna do some problems. Hopefully it'll help you. Look at that, we're 15 minutes in and we're already 14 slides in. We are rocking and rolling for sure. Okay. All right. So earlier we took some samples. So what I did is I took my population standard deviation. We were told it was 0 0.02 and divided it by the square root of five. Five was our, um, was our sample size originally. When I do that calculation, I get this right here. So the actual standard deviation of those means is this right here. This is what we found. That is really, really close. I don't think anybody's going to be mad about being three ten thousandths off. That is a lot less than the difference between the two fastest men in the world in the 100 yard dash, 100 meter dash at the Olympics. Because they were five thousandths off. Yeah. So this is even a lot less than that. So it is really, really close. So let's take a look when we have the bigger sample size. What that bigger sample size was 200. Let's do that. Or 20. Sorry. Let's do a bigger sample size of 20. So with this one, I'm taking this, the sample size of 20. So I still do the population standard deviation divided by the square root of 20, and I get 0, 0, 0.45. So when I actually did the math in our example earlier, whoa, our example earlier, it is exactly the same. So as your sample size gets bigger, it becomes closer and closer to that average. Big sample sizes are good. We want bigger sample sizes. Those are important. Questions so far? We're going to do some examples, but anyone have questions so far? 
All right. So this is important. If the random variable X is normally distributed, then the distribution of the sample mean X bar is also normally distributed. So our sampling distribution will be normally distributed if our random variable is normally distributed. So if one's normal, the other will also be normal. All right. All right, so let's do an example. So an intelligence quotient or an IQ, it's a measurement of intelligence, obviously, we know about this. So their um, scores on the test are approximately normally distributed with a mean score of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. We want to find the mean and the standard error or the new standard deviation, so it's sigma sub x bar with the sample size n equals 9. Okay. So the mean is easy. So remember that mu sub x bar equals mu. Therefore, our mu sub x bar equals 100. Mu sub x bar is just what we're using for the mean of the sampling distribution. Now I'm not gonna get mad come test day if you don't use the proper notation, I'm not gonna get mad at you because your work is just your working stuff. And it's hard to, I mean, yeah, you can type math into um, Blackboard, but it's not super fun, as you may have noticed. Blackboard's easier than email, though. You can't type math in email at all. It's one of the reasons I prefer Blackboard is because I can type math at you guys. All right, so then our standard deviation sub X bar it's going to be the population standard deviation, which is 15, divided by the square root of 9. I love it when I get a sample size that can easily square root, because I can do this math all day long in my head. So my sa standard deviation or standard error of my sa sample means is 5. Questions? Um, and, no, I mean, pro yeah, I probably would not try to throw units at it. It's not really technically unitless, but I probably wouldn't throw units at it. We're just going to leave it alone. <laughs> what is this an what example of? What was that? What is this an example of? Because I got a little confused when we were talking about the slide where we we're talking about pennies. Okay. So let me, I'll go back to the pennies just a second here. Okay. So I took, so 200 times I grabbed five pennies and I averaged their weight. So this right here is the average of weight of one group of five pennies. Okay. Then I did it, I did it 200 times. I took five samples of pennies 200 times and I averaged their weight. And then I took all of these averages and I averaged all of the averages. And what did I get? And I got this right here. So I took all of those averages and I averaged all of the averages. So what it does when you, so my population, when, when I'm not taking samples, the population is spread out a lot more because let me see what my population standard deviation was. Hold on a second here. My population standard deviation, I mean, it's 0 0.02 grams, but it's still, it's more spread out because you think about, so this is for my population, but if I take all of these samples and I take all of their means, the standard deviation of all of their means is super small. Look at this. So when I take the, it's like barely spread out at all. So it's just one way to kind of um, be a little bit more precise than when we're just taking one sample.
we're taking a lot of samples and then we're using all of that sample data to to find out information. So what okay. I did, does that help at all? A little bit. So the one that we just did as an example, uh -huh. um, is that an example of the sampling distribution? Yeah, so right here, so notice that I have a sample size of nine. So what I did was I take a whole bunch of samples size nine. So a whole bunch of people, I take, I find nine random people and I find out what their IQ is. And then I find the average of that. Then I take nine more people, find out their IQs and average those IQs. And I do this a whole bunch of times. So that data, instead of having a standard deviation of 15, because I am taking the, the average of those averages is what I'm using. Um, so to so see, because I'm using averages of each group, I get to have a smaller standard deviation. My standard deviation is now five because I'm using all of these little samples instead of the whole question. I have a question about this too. Yes. So we have the sample size of nine and the standard deviation of the mean score, but how come we don't have the number of trials included in this? Because we don't know. It's a, it's a, just a whole lot of samples nines. Okay. Yeah. We're just taking a sampling distribution of sample size nine. So that's, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many samples we're taking. So that's just what we're basing it on. So our sampling distribution, we're basing it on sample sizes of nine. And, and the number of samples we take would be dependent on how big your population is. Because I'm going to have fewer samples if my population is 200 than if my population is 10 million, obviously. So that it it doesn't change the numbers depending on how many samples we took. This is kind of why we have these formulas instead of um, having to actually collect all the samples. They figured out that this formula will work no matter how many samples we take, as long as we know the sample size. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Let's do another one. Okay, I would like you to try this using those formulas. So the weight of pennies we have, we know that they're normally distributed, a mean of 2.46 grams and a standard deviation of 0 0.02. You will need your calculator because I didn't give you nine. So we want to know, oh wait, so just find the mean and standard deviation. We'll do the probability part together. So find the mean and the standard deviation of a simple random samples of 10 pennies. Oops. So find that mean and standard deviation, then we'll do the, the probability together. Right, so our mean still 2.46 because we just take the population mean, standard deviation. If you don't know where the square button is, a square root button on your calculator, hit the second button, so the blue button, and then your x squared button. So second x squared will give you that. How'd we do? Yep. Yeah, good job. I just rounded to four. 
It doesn't matter where you round to. Okay. So you'll be happy to know that you're not learning a new calculator function with this. We are using the same old calculator function. The only difference is we are substituting this for this, the standard deviation. So it's just normal CDF. And you want to know at least 2.465 grams. So that means greater than or equal to. So we do 2.465 comma 1E99 comma. Our mean is 2.46. Then use the new standard deviation. So I'm going to explain in a second what it means, what we just found. I got this approximately. How'd we do? Okay, so what we found, basically what, what we're wanting to know is, is if I took a sample of size 10, I take a sample of size 10, what is the probability that the average, the average weight of that sample is 2.465 or greater? That's what I found out. So of the sample that I pulled, the 10 pennies I pulled, what's the probability that the average weight of those pennies is greater than 2.465. That's what I calculated. Questions? All right. So this is what it would look like to draw it. Um, they, I have no idea that it, my curriculum at the high school does the same thing. They convert everything to Z-scores. I mean, I'm not like anti-Z-score, but I don't understand. I guess if you're using the table, it's great to convert it to Z-scores. Otherwise, I feel it's not quite as accurate because you're doing so much rounding. Because this number right here, I mean, everything is rounding. And because I had to round my Z-score. So I'm not, I'm just not the biggest fan of using Z-scores, but... If you want to convert everything to Z-scores and do a little bit extra work, go for it. <laughs> go for it. But I highly recommend just using the data values. That's why we have these calculators, so that we don't have to do extra work, like change everything into Z-scores. Right. Okay, here's another example. And I want you to um, I want you to try this one without me and I will work quietly behind you. So once again, we're at IQ scores. I wanna compute the probability that a simple random sample of size 10 results in a mean, a sample mean greater than 110. So if I take a sample of 10, take a random sample of 10 people, what's the probability that their average IQ is greater than 110? So I'm looking for, yep, this is right here.
Let me see. What did you get? Oh, that's the old one. I was like, that doesn't look anything like my number. How'd we do? Good job. So did you, is yours rounding or I, I see, I didn't um, round my standard deviation when I put it into my calculator. So it might be different if I um, rounded it. Let me try it. 4.74. Four. Okay. Yeah. So I'll fix that. Because I just pasted um, the unrounded number. I'll do four. I pasted the unrounded number into my normal CDF because I do weird things like that. But yeah, 0 0.174. Not that anybody's going to be mad if you rounded it, if um, you didn't round pre and do your thing. Questions on this? Is there ever going to be a situation where, for example, the infinity would be our um, lower fence instead of the upper fence? Yeah, I mean, I could have said, what's the probability that um, in a simple random sample of size 10, the um, sample mean is less than 95? Oh, okay. I could have said that, yeah. Then it would be um, negative 1E99 e to 95. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. So yeah, if you're doing less than, you're going to use the um, negative 1E99. Good question, though. Any other questions before we move on? Just really important to remember the um, the new standard deviation. All right. So let's talk, this is gonna be super fast. Um, we're gonna talk about if we have a not normal population. So I always talk about when I'm talking about um, uniform distribution, about rolling dice. Um, so this is a case of that right here. And rolling dice, obviously, it is uniformly distributed. It's not normal. So you could have something like this, or you could have something skewed. So if you have a population that is not normal, this is one nice thing about this, because when we have a not normal population, a lot of our analysis methods we're not allowed to use if the population isn't normal. Therefore, using sampling distribution, it helps us to like normalize our population. The way we do that, I'm going to my next screen. So um, uh, 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 let's see here, I'm gonna show you what happens. So I'm gonna start with sample size of four, then I'm gonna go to 10 and 30. And so let me show you what happens. So here's sample size four. So it's still not quite normal. It's not uniform anymore. It's not quite normal. We're skewed a little bit to the right. Here's a sample size of 10. This is looking better. Look what happens when I get to a sample size of 30. This is a beautiful, perfect bell-shaped. This is like completely symmetric. So as our sample size gets larger, our population becomes more normal. I'm gonna put that right here. This is called um, the central limit theorem. I'm not gonna ask you to memorize that. I mean, I love it when people reference it, but don't worry about that. But this right here, the shape of the distribution of the sample mean becomes normal as the sample size increases. So generally, if our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, this is gonna be um, our sampling distribution is normal. So 30 is just kind of the rule of thumb that we use for the central limit theorem. But as our sample size gets 30 or larger, then no matter what our population looks like, our sampling distribution is normal. So 30 is kind of like your go-to right there. Otherwise, it needs to tell you that the um, population is normal. So it'll say like something like, you know, the random variable X is approximately normal. Then you don't have to worry about what your sample size is. 
But if it doesn't tell you or if your population isn't normal, then our rule of thumb is greater than 30. Give you a moment. Okay. Okay, so you're going to have questions that look like this in your homework. It's going to say, describe the sampling distribution of the sample mean. All it means is give me the, the um, all it means is to give me the mean and the standard deviation or the mean and the standard error. That's all it's asking for. So if it asks you to describe the sampling distribution, just give me the mean and the standard deviation. So we'll have our mu sub x bar. It's going to equal... 11.4 and then your standard deviation sub x bar that's I forgot the bar will be 3.2 by 35 square root of 35 crazy me that's really ugly I'm going to fix it I'm just going to leave it at 0 0.54 because there's a zero after that. Okay, so this is an example of less than right here. So go ahead and calculate this. If a random sample of 35 oil changes is selected, what is the probability the mean oil change time is less than 11 minutes? So go ahead and calculate this. Don't forget to use the new standard deviation for your um, standard deviation. How'd we do? So one of the things that this can be used for, um, so let's say somebody's putting out some information, like for this example, um, somebody's putting information out there and they're saying, hey, look at my shop. The average um, time it takes for an oil change is 11.4 minutes with this standard deviation. Um, you know, come on in and get your oil changed because this is a really good time, whatever. Um, and somebody takes a sample and like, let's say that I took a random sample of 35 and I got an um, an average an average time in that thirty five of thirteen minutes. If I calculate the probability that um, I would have an oil change of thirteen minutes, uh, given this mean and standard deviation, and I find out that that probability is super low, I would be questioning the information they gave me. So. I would be saying, I don't think that your average is actually 11.4 because the probability of me getting this sample is so low with your average you gave me. So that would be something saying, I don't think what you're saying is reasonable. I think you're lying to me. I think you're making up stories. So, or there's something else going on here. And I believe... In the next section, we're going to kind of have a couple of those examples. But basically, it's a way to um, like 
you know, test the credibility of claims because most of the time we can't poll an entire population. So, so for example, uh, manufacturing, they could say that this is how much um, the average bag of potato chips weighs coming out of our manufacturing plant. This is how much it weighs. And this is what the standard deviation is. So quality control would go in there and they would take a sample of, let's say, 20 potato chip bags and they would weigh them all and find the average of that weight. And then they could do this math and they can be like, hey, um, the probability of my sample having the weight that I got is really, really small. So I think that you are misleading people on how many potato chips are in your bag. So it's kind of a way to test the information you're given about what the average is of whatever it is. So you're kind of testing credibility there. All right, questions, I think we're moving on to, yep, we're moving on to 8.2, we're done with 8.1. Any questions before I pop on over to 8.2? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh, for the, for um, B, what are the actual numbers for this normal CDF for the lower bound and the upper bound? So our lower bound here was negative 1E99 because we're doing less than. So it was um, normal. I'll write it down. So I did negative 1E99. And then my upper bound was 11 because we're saying less than 11 minutes. Oh, okay. 11.4 right. and 0 0.54. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else before we move on to 8.2? All right. Okay. So I want you to take everything I just taught you, all the stuff to do with means, and I want you to put it in your pocket. I want you to put it away because now we are jumping to proportions. So we're going away from means now, and we're going to jump over to proportions. So put it in your pocket, hold on to it for later. And um, we're going to jump into proportions. So we've done point estimates. We just called them different things. We're going to stick with point estimates, though, for the rest of this, um, the rest of the term. So the next three chapters, chapter nine and chapter 10 lean heavily on some of the chapter eight stuff. So if I'm doing a sampling distribution of population proportion, this usually is categorical data. Um, so with the means, with the 8.1 stuff, that's your quantitative stuff. The population proportions, most of it is looking at the percent of people that have a certain characteristic. So a lot of it is categorical. So um, what a point estimate is just like when we were calculating our um, experimental probability or just like when we were calculating our relative frequency, you're taking the number of successes divided by your total number of, of trials or your sample size. So this is number of successes That's really ugly, but you can see that hopefully you can see that's a C. And then this is your sample size. This is called a point estimate, and my open math will call it a point estimate most of the time, but we also call it p hat. And I will mostly refer to it as p hat. So anything with a hat on it is an estimate. Anything with a hat is an estimate. And so p hat is an estimate of the proportion of the people that have some sort of a characteristic. So that's that's just what it is. And um, once again, we're estimating a population proportion. So usually we don't know the prop population proportion when we're using this math. So that's what a point estimate is. And we'll be using point estimate this chapter, chapter nine and chapter 10. So um, P hat is a statistic because it is a, it is based on a sample that estimates the population. Okay. So a Quinnipiac University poll um, in, in 2008 asked whether they approved of the way George W. Bush was handling the economy. 349 people said yes. So our P hat, our point estimate, so we're looking for a point estimate, whoops, 
point estimate here is 349, so my p hat, 349 divided by 1745, because that was my sample size. And we just get our decimal based on that. So this is 0 0.2. So my p hat, 0 0.2. So based on this particular poll, 20% of people felt that George W. Bush was handling the economy appropriately. So that's what p hat is. So go ahead and find your p hat for this one. Um, we took a survey of 1,000 adults. They asked, are you currently on some form of a low carbohydrate diet? Of those surveyed, 150 said they were. So go ahead and find that p hat. don't need to use my calculator, but I'm gonna use it anyway because it's there, I'm here. So you should have done. There we go, that's our point estimate, that's our P hat. Okay. It doesn't get super difficult. There's a few things we have to check, but it doesn't get too, too bad. All right. So I'm gonna once again we're gonna look at um, we're gonna look at some data and we're gonna look at some graphs so you can kind of see what happens. So according to a time poll conducted in June of 2008, 42 percent of registered voters believe that gay and lesbian couples should be allowed to marry. So we're gonna look at the sampling distributions of the sampling um, proportions with different sample size. So I'm gonna use simulations and I'm gonna create a histograms for sample sizes of 10 of 50 and 100, so let's take a look. So here's the, I'm with a sample size of 10. You can see my mean, it's little, but you can see the mean and the standard deviation right here. So we're at 42.6%. My standard deviation is 0 0.16. And you can see that we're a little bit right skewed. Let's make my sample size larger. Let's go to 50. So this is interesting. So we're still at 0 0.426, that's good. Standard deviation is getting much smaller here. It is 0 0.072, We're getting closer to normal. Let's take a look at sample size 100. I mean, if I could just get rid of these, it would be exactly perfectly normal, but it's still, it's, it's all bunched right there in the middle. I love that my standard deviation is super, super small. We're exactly 42%. So what we're doing is we take these samples and you find those proportions and then they become a mean. So like I took 300 samples of size 100 and found out the P hat, the proportion of the people in that sample. And then now I can just use that as my mean. So you'll see in a second. So um, this is a way instead of using binomials because we all love binomials, right? Instead of using binomials, we can now just use normal CDF. And the nice thing about normal CDF is you don't have to use the complement rule. You just throw it in there and it's good. It kind of, it's another way of standardizing things. So I'll show you in the math in a minute. But once again, so as my sample size increases, the shape becomes normal. This one right here, so my mean sub p hat is going to equal my population proportion. So mean sub p hat equals your population proportion. And as the standard deviation, or as my sampling size increases, my standard deviation is gonna get smaller, just like with means. So as I get bigger and bigger sample sizes, my standard deviation is going to get smaller and smaller. You saw how the histograms got squishier and squishier as we went like went like right around the middle. And we are once again gonna get a, new, a formula for another new standard deviation, just to let you know. Okay. This right here is the new formula. These are the things that you need to check. Um, 
these are the things that you need to check before doing this type of sampling distribution. All right, so first thing, in order to determine that th that our population is normal or a sampling distribution is normal, sorry, NP times one minus P has to be greater than or equal to 10. We need to check this. And there's another thing not on here, but we'll look at that in the next thing. So, and then we do, we make the mean sub P hat equals the population proportion. So whatever the average of all of the means of our samples are, that's our population proportion. You'll be given that, don't worry. And then this is how we calculate our standard deviation. You take the, the population proportion that they gave you, multiply it by one minus the complement of that population proportion, divide by your sample size, and then take the square root. This is your new standard deviation. Uh oh, that's not a pen, that's a highlighter. New standard deviation. or standard error. Same thing, standard error and new standard deviation are the same thing. I believe there's a handout comparing the two things. And I think I might have a slide at the end of this. I can't remember. It's the thing is it's like the day before this class, I work on the PowerPoints. And then by the time class shows up, I forget if I put the extra things in there or not. We're gonna do some examples. We're already on, we're on slide 37 of 45. We are almost done. Y'all are rock stars. Okay, moving on. Okay, this is the other thing right here. So in order to use the other model that we have, the sample size has to be no more than 5% of the population. So in order to use the um, this method of analysis, our sample size has to be no more than 5% of the population. This assures that, it's, that um, our samples are independent. I'm gonna write that down, shows independence. All right. Now I'm not gonna ask you to remember that that shows independence. Um, I'm not gonna make you explain that to me. I'm just kind of explaining it to you because if I, if I have, like let's say that I have our class of 25 people. Um, if I start taking sample sizes of 18, those aren't really samples. If I take five sample sizes of 18, that doesn't make sense. Those are not gonna be independent samples. If I take a bunch of samples of size two, I'm gonna get a lot of different samples that don't have the same people in them. But if I took a sample size of 18, I'm gonna have almost all of the same people in all my samples. So that's why the sample needs to be less than 5% of the population so I can have truly independent samples. All right, let's, math. let's do some math. Okay, once again, describing the sampling distribution is just finding the mean and the standard deviation. So according to a time poll conducted in June of 2008, 42% of registered voters believe that gay and lesbian couples should be allowed to marry. We obtain a simple random sample of 50 voters. We're gonna describe our sampling distribution. So once again, so my mean sub P hat is going to be the 42%. Turn it into a decimal. Standard deviation, sub p hat, is going to be the square root of 0.42 times one minus 0.42 divided by 50. You can put this whole thing in your calculator if you're really careful with parentheses. If you're putting it in your calculator all at once, 
put parentheses around here. Or you can do it piece by piece. It doesn't matter to me. So I got the new standard deviation. Oops. It's approximately 0 0.0698. So now instead of using... Um, Instead of using binomial CDF or PDF or whatever, I can use normal CDF because now I have a mean because I can use that as my mean. And now I have a standard deviation, which we normally don't have when we're using proportions. Questions before we move on to probability stuff? All right. We already just did this. So in our simulation, we got a standard deviation of 0 0.072. This is pretty close. This is very close. But important things. Um, our sample of n equals 50, it's less than 5% of the population of the voters in the US. This right here, greater than or equal to 10, that's good. And so, uh-oh, I lost pieces. So P hat, I don't know what happened. So my standard deviation is that. So if I needed to do math with this, I could. Okay, we're gonna actually math it out now, I think. I'm gonna move on. Okay, so um, we're going to do some, um, gonna do some math here um, with probabilities. So according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 18.8% .8 of school children aged 6 to 11 were overweight in 2004. In a random sample of 90 school-aged children aged 6 to 11, what's the probability that at least 19% are overweight? Right. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find our mean and our new standard deviation. So I'm going to do mu sub p hat is going to be 0 0.188 because that's what they gave us up here. That's what they're giving us as our population standard deviation or our population mean. So you just use what they gave you. Okay. So now my sigma sub p hat is going to be the square root of 0.188 times 1 minus 0.188 divided by, we have a sample size of 90. Use your fancy schmancy. Give you all a second to put it into your own calculator. One second here. All right. So what we're trying to find here, we're going to do our normal CDF. What it's asking us is we're looking for what is the probability of finding at least 19% overweight? So I'm going to say 
um, my at least means greater than or equal to, right? So my lower value is 0.19. My upper value is 1E99. Then I have 0.188, which is my mean, and then 0 0.0412, which is the standard deviation. So go ahead and put that in your calculator. Don't forget that extra zero in your 0 0.0412. I got approximately about 48%. All right, how'd we do? Okay, so the bottom, I wanna put this, block this off. The bottom question asks me, suppose a random sample of 90 school-age children ages six to 11 results in 24 overweight children. What might you conclude? Oh, good, good. So, Basically it's saying, I took a sample of 90 kids and 24 of them were overweight. So this whole, what might you conclude? Basically what it wants you to do is take a look at the probability. And if it's unusual, you're probably gonna have a conclusion. So I need to know that P hat. That P hat is approximately 0 0.2667. So now what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna show you, you can put, put fractions in your calculator. I'm gonna show you this in a second. I'm gonna pop over to the calculator. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do normal CDF. So what is the probability what is the probability of 24 or more kids? Because this number is larger than the 18.8%, I'm gonna say greater than. We always do that. So if this number was significantly smaller than the 18.8, I would say less than, but I'm gonna do greater than. So I'm gonna do um, 0 0.2667 comma 1E99. 0 0.188 0 0.0412. Okay. I'm going to pop over to my other screen to my calculator and do this normal CDF. So rather than using my P hat so that I'm not rounding, I'm just going to put the fraction in here 24 divided by 90 because these boxes can do the math for you. Then 1E99, e then my mean is 0.188, standard deviation, woo. So that ends up being quite the unusual number. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Okay. That ends up being quite the small number. So that's less than 3%. So I'm going to go write this over here. The what might you conclude if you get a question like that on your homework? This is just you making up some, um, making up a number, um, making up words. I might conclude that things have changed since 2004 
that we have a larger obesity population now, and maybe we need to revisit um, this, um, whatever this data, revisit our population, our prediction here. Uh, you could say that maybe we ended up with a large number of students that are kids that live in food deserts. Basically, you're going to need to take another, I would say, take another sample. Whenever you end up with some, with an unusual sample, you're going to want to take another one. So you're just going to want to basically say what, what could have caused us to have an unusual sample. So th things have probably changed since 2004. I am, my guess is that um, obesity in kids is probably higher than 18.8% right now. I mean, I don't know what you all believe but or think, but I think it's probably higher. Okay, questions before we do one more example? Okay, oh, here's the math. Yeah, they wanted you to do um, do Z-scores. Don't do Z-scores. Once again, um, 90 is less than 5% of the entire population of school-age children. NP times 1 minus P is 13.7. Therefore, it is, um, therefore, we can say that it is normal or it is, um, yeah, we're good. Um, our, we're approximately normal with that mean and that standard deviation. And then there's our uh, our math right there. It's exactly what we just did. And then what they said is, um, they just said that it's unusual. They didn't give me a story. I like stories. They didn't give me a story. But just if you just tell me it's unusual, I'm good. Okay. I want you to do this one start to finish. This is our last slide. This is the last one. I would like you to do this one start to finish. Um, National Center for Health Statistics says 15% of all Americans have hearing trouble. In a random sample of 120 Americans, what is the probability at most, which means less than or equal to, 12% have hearing trouble? And then you can take a look at B on your own. I'll give you a minute, minute or two, and I'll work behind you.
have my answer. Go ahead and look up whenever you are done and see how you did. We do. So this question specifically chose um, Americans that regularly listen to music using headphones to compare to the statistics from the National Center for Health Statistics. And what, but if I, basically the conclusion here that we could say is that using the headphones likely is causing hearing damage or that we can assume that it possibly is because having this sample, if their actual mean was 15%, um, would be unusual. Did you have a question, Hannah? I do have a question. So when it comes to question B, when it says 120 Americans and then it results in 126 is this just kind of a common sense where like in our heads, like that seems like a lot. So we're going to put that number in front. Right. Because, um, because I got this right here and this uh, is higher than 15%. Oh, I'm saying what, what is the probability of having a sample with greater than or equal to that? And if it was lower, let's say, for example, let's pretend that my P hat, if my P hat was 8%, I would do less than or equal to. Gotcha. Thank you. It's just whatever side of the, the mean you land on, just keep going. Make the whole tail. That was a good question. Thank you. Anyone else? So if it's asking if it's unusual or not, how do you determine that? If, it, if the probability is less than 5%, then it is considered unusual. So the 0 0.02 is what we'd be looking at. And then yep. that's less than 5%. Yep. So since that's 2%, then it's considered unusual. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, if I, if I took, a, um, so if I took a whole bunch of samples, so I took a whole bunch of samples of size um, 120, um, uh, 2% of them would have a, um, have this have 26 out of 120 people with hearing trouble. So it, it's really unlikely. It's unlikely that you would get a random sample with the um, 26 out of 120 people if the actual was 15%. So basically it's kind of conditional. It's saying if the actual um, proportion of people with hearing trouble, hearing loss is 15%, if that is true, then I only have a 2% chance of getting a sample like this. So um, so basically it's saying that probably people that listen to music using headphones, their hearing trouble is they, they have a higher hearing trouble. So I would assume that the headphones are causing it. But almost always, if you end up with an unusual sample, it just means we need to study this more. Let's take more samples. Let's do this again. So I'm gonna look at a couple of homework problems. I'm going to go back here. I, don't I have a question real quick. Go ahead. Um, on that last one. So if it was less than 15%, um, let's just use that 0 0.08. So that 8% oh. would be your upper. Yes. So I would do this. Okay. I would write it up above here. I would do normal. Where is my pen? Normal CDF. CDF. And then I would do negative 1E99. 0.08, okay. oh. yeah, 0.15, and then 0 0.0326. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to jump on a couple of homework problems so you guys can see um, what's going to be expected. Okay, let's go to section 8.1. One. I don't know why I have the week five forum on Monday. I'm going to move that. 
Okay, let's see here, teacher preview. Okay, so this question right here is the most commonly asked question, question that, or problem that people have. Wait, that's not the one. This one is good anyway. This isn't the most common, but it is pretty common. So you're gonna find use your mean. So remember your um, mean equals the population mean. So I would put this right here. Calculate your new standard deviation. Put the mean right here. Then take this standard deviation, multiply it by two, add it to the mean that's going right there. Take the standard deviation, multiply it by two, subtract it from the mean, that's going right there. You're just building the normal curve. So this is two below and this is two above. So two of these standard deviations. So Can you say that again? <laughs> it won't even give me the answers. This is weird. Okay. So you're gonna your mean is just the population mean that they gave me. So this is 125. Because it's not showing me. So that's 125.5. So I'm gonna put that right there. Then I'm whatever my standard deviation is, which I guess is 5.81. You're calculating the new standard deviation with that formula I gave you, the sigma divided by square root of um, the sample size. So you'll calculate that. That goes right here, which is 5.81. So you're using the two standard deviation rule to find your boundaries here. This is two standard deviations below. So you would do 125.5 minus two times 5.81 to get this value. Then 125.5 plus two times 5.81 to get that value. And then you just put those there. Okay, I'm gonna scroll down because that's not the problem that I was talking about. Where is it? This one, this is the one right here. Okay. All right, so this right here, this is your sampling distribution. So this has your new standard deviation represented in the diagram. Second, I'm gonna write my, write something down here. It is, this one gave me, it gives me the population standard deviation. It gives me sigma. It does not give me N. Down here, I can find my sigma sub X bar. So, cause this right here is one, sta one new standard deviation above the mean. So you can see my sigma sub X bar is just three. So you're gonna use the formula and a little bit of algebra to solve, to find your sample size. So let me go back to my other screen. So my sigma sub X bar was three based on that picture. I didn't get the, hold on, standard deviation. My sigma, is that 12 or 21? 21, is 21 right there. So therefore I put, just put it into the formula. Now just use algebra to solve for N. Just use your algebra and you just solve for N. Okay, so my sample size is 49. I better have gotten that. Yeah, good. So all you're doing is doing the, the algebra. You're just plugging it into the formula. So some of them, um, some of you will have solving for standard deviation and some of you will have solving for N, but it's just basically the same thing. It's just a different thing you're solving for. So you're gonna be either solving for standard deviation or N. I got lost. Okay. Where did I lose you? Um, when I scrolled down to this problem? Yeah. When you <laughs> scrolled to whatever else. I got yeah. <laughs> okay. So this diagram right here is the sampling distribution. This has the new standard deviation and it has, um, and this, this is the mean, but it has, it represents the new standard deviation. So if I take 136 minus 133, I can see my new standard deviation is three. OK, 
okay? And it gives me the population standard deviation is 21. So this is sigma. And it doesn't give me the sample size. I have to find that. So I'm going to pop over here. This is the formula that we use for a new standard deviation. Based on the diagram, my new standard deviation is three. So that goes right there. Based on what they gave me up top, my sigma, my population standard deviation is 21. That goes right there. This is where this came from. And all I did was use algebra to solve for n. So asking for a standard deviation, is it the opposite of this? Yeah, so let's let, I'm gonna make numbers up now. So um, actually I'm just gonna use, let's, let's pretend that, let's pretend my sample size is 21 and I'm looking for the standard deviation just to make use, because I still want to use this. So let's pretend my sample size. So let's pretend, let's say that N is 21. I don't know what's going to happen here. And that my sigma sub X bar is three. Then instead, it's going to look like this. And you're just going to solve for sigma instead. So you're still just using algebra, you're just solving for a different thing. Okay. My algebra is rusty. Um, <laughs> the part where I'm getting stuck on is in the 21 over n. How did that, uh, when it's three equals 21 over square root of n, how did that become a seven on the next line? <laughs> I can multiply both sides by square root of n. Uh -huh. That gives me three square root of n equals 21. Now, <laughs> divide both sides by three, and then I have this right there. Thank you. <laughs> There's an other, there is another more magical way to get there, which is the way I do it in my head, but I'm not going to give you that because we don't need magic. So, <laughs> this one, I mean, this is a little bit easier because it's just going to be three times the square root of 21. It'll be a little bit easier, even though I gave you ugly numbers there. Okay, there's one more problem I want to look at. And it's going to be kind of the same for um, proportions in. Okay, hold on. Might not be in here. It might be in the proportions one. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, this one right here is good. So this question right here. So it gives me the length of pregnancies in a small rural rural the rural village uh, that are normally distributed has a mean and a standard deviation. The first question right here does not involve samples. It just wants to know in what range you would expect to find the middle 50% of pregnancies. Jump back to chapter six. Use your inverse norm for the middle 50% because there's no sample size. If there's no sample size, you are not using a new standard deviation because there's no sample size. The bottom now says, if I was gonna draw a sample size of 32 from this population, now use inverse norm with the new standard deviation. Sample sizes, if they give you a sample size, use your new standard deviation. If they don't give you sample size, use your original standard deviation. So this question nine right here, the first part is inverse norm with the original standard deviation. The second part, inverse norm using new standard deviation. Questions? Did you say if the sample size is given, use the new standard deviation? And if it's not, use the old one? Yes, exactly. Okay. That wraps awesome. it Thank up you. beautifully. You're welcome. Now, there is a handout y'all might um, be interested in. I saw Evelyn crying and Edie and Javier were dealing with their baby. Uh, are you okay? 
All right, so in here, there's a handout I'm gonna show you, and it compares them for the means and the proportions. And this would be a great thing to put in your notes if you wanna print it out. It compares um, what, we need, what you need to know, the information you need to know. So it's just located at the bottom of the, um, the table. So I, it's super helpful and it gives you everything. So I recommend printing that out. And that's all I have. I am, I am done unless you have questions. Hmm. Questions while we're on recording. Seems easy enough. <laughs> I hope so. I hope once you get into it, especially since I went over those few problems, hoping once you get into it, you'll be fine. And you all know where to find me if you I, get struggle. Go ahead, Hannah. Oh, I don't have a question exactly, but I wanted to share a calculator function. I don't know if you said this already, okay. but in case you didn't. Okay. Um, I find sometimes I'm really far into an equation and I forgot to do something way back when. Uh -huh. And I found... Um, Second INS, second insert yes. has been my best friend. Yes. Yes. I love that function. That is so, like, like if I was doing like 3.87945 and I'm like, oh no, I need to have a zero up there so I can do this. Actually, I think it goes here and I do second. It's the delete button. It's insert. And now I can put a zero in there. So it should have been on the eight. I'm going to delete that. So if you do your second insert, then you can insert that zero in there. Whoops, I didn't do it. Command Z, let me do that. Now I can insert the eight because I accidentally deleted it. So I'm gonna put that eight in there now. There we go. I love that button. That's one of my favorites. I use it a lot. <laughs> so yeah, that's how you insert. There's so many cool things. This calculator does so many cool things, but I'm not gonna overwhelm y'all. Anybody else for the for the good of the class? That's a, recording? that's a game changer. I had no idea that that button existed. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Hannah, you are now in his will. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn the recording off.